we know, with the caveat that probably 40%, but I don't know which 40%. Okay, so next slide, please. <clears throat> that's because we're still learning, and that's the exciting bit. There's what we think is happening, and then there's what's actually happening, which may not be what we think is happening. So the best example I can give of that, and you'll know this, um, but it used to be said that when you're doing uh, work on the fascia, that you are using compression and heat and you're melting the tissue. That's wrong. We know that's not what's happening. I'll talk more about what we think is happening, but we know that that one's wrong because it's been tested, and you just can't generate that much heat and that much pressure. So. Um, I don't know why that slide always comes in looking so very white. Go ahead and hit the button again. So basically, I deal with people who come in to see me. They've got pain problems. They've been in surgeries. Uh, they've had transplants. They've uh, been recovering from cancer. You, you name the accident, injury, or indignity that they've suffered. And basically, they have fallout. They have things that don't work right, work as good as they used to, work as well as they think they could work, and nobody knows what to do with them. Those are my favorite kind of people to see. And they come in somewhere on this vicious cycle uh, that I've outlined here in this slide. So what I endeavor to do is to you know, listen to their story of what it's basically, I think of it as a body interview. I want to know what's it like to be you. What's it, what's it feel like to be you on a daily basis? What's it feel like to be you when you're trying to do the things that you want to do or enjoy doing? Not just the things you have to do, but the things you enjoy doing or the things you want to be doing more of. And I take into consideration where all those points are on this circle. And then I say, hi, we've just met. You've told me about you for 15 minutes. Now, please get into your underwear and listen to what's going on. <laughs> because I'm a professional. And, uh, but what that does, what that does is you've got to look. Because, as we'll see here shortly, um, your body is designed to reorganize itself based on what you do, what happens to you, and how you're recovering from what happens to you. And that, over time, and by time, I mean anywhere from nine months to two years or longer, is going to affect your shape. That doesn't look so good, does it? I mean, without even looking about where's the hips, where's the, without getting into the anatomy at all, that doesn't look terribly nice or comfortable. Now, this is pretty typical for me on seeing somebody for the first time. Uh, and they may not look exactly like this. They'll have their own peculiarities. Not everybody fits an easy pattern uh, to divine. And the idea is to is to get them looking like that in a reasonable number of visits in a way that is sustainable, in a way that hopefully educates them uh, to how they got that way in the first place. Do we always find the root cause? No. But we almost always find the perpetuating factors. Did it again. And I do this utilizing predominantly a method known as structural integration which is probably something that you've never heard of before, or if you have, you think it's because I'm in Pittsburgh, it's something to do with bridges. <laughs> and it's not that far off. So how many of you have heard of Rolfing? Okay, great. Rolfing is a brand name. Okay. Uh, Rolfing is like Big Mac. Okay, there's Hellerwork, which is like a Whopper. I'm Kinesis Myofascial Integration. I'm a Royale with cheese. But it's all hamburger. Okay? So structural integration it is a term like hamburger, and all the little individuations are more or less just brand names by virtue of where you went to school. Now, it was founded by this woman, Dr. Ida Rolf, uh, hence the term Rolfing, like FedExit or Xeroxit, Rolfit, okay? It's just one of those things that became a verb. She didn't like it, but she couldn't stop it either. Uh, and she was the one, because of her own uh, struggles with arthritis, uh, and then she then was doing this crazy stuff back in the 20s. She would actually have to travel by rail to do this stuff called yoga. Um, and she also liked to hang out with osteopaths. She also was a biochemist. And if you look at that slide, you'll see that she graduated with her PhD from Columbia University one year after women were given the right to vote in this country. So she had to be pretty fierce in order to do that. And people who knew her said she was very fierce. Um, but she created the basic framework that today is known as the process of structural integration because it's not just a, a way of doing manual applications uh, with your hands, your arms, and so on, but it's also a specific process and methodology, a way of looking at the body, understanding how these 212 moving parts are connected in 1,297 different ways and how they have to interact with each other because we don't come in parts. 
it's useful to break the body down into parts to understand how they all work together, but the body doesn't think and the body doesn't work in parts. Okay, next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> this was uh, the doctor who invented osteopathy, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, unlike what I do. Um, and basically that, that is the sine qua non of, of what it is that, that I or any good uh, structural body worker or therapist should do is be able to determine something about the person's function just by looking at their structure like we did with that slide of the woman before all her sessions where she looked all more like a Picasso than a Rembrandt, shall we say. Next slide. Okay, and we leverage this by working the fascia, the, the organ of posture. So when I'm talking about fascia, I'm talking about the white stuff. I'm talking about these things around the muscle tissue. I'm talking about these pockets that are actually, we're looking at this part of the leg, and that's where the muscles would be inside of. Next slide. Uh, so for years, it was thought to be basically an inert tissue. Uh, it didn't really, it was just insulation. It was stuff that kept everything else from, uh, it was a bit like time. Time is what keeps everything from happening all at once. So fascia was what kept everything in the body from being, uh, being all swished up against each other. So it gave us some separation. But what it also gives us is connectivity. And it was the journal Science that called it the Cinderella of orthopedic medicine because it was kind of the shoe that everybody forgot about up until recent times. Next slide. So that report came out um, right after the first fascia congress, which we'll talk about in a minute. So what fascia is, so there's a really nice picture of it there uh, around the gastrocnemius, one of your calf muscles, and uh, hit it again. So fascia is basically everything you don't find in your typical anatomy textbooks because it just wasn't deemed it wasn't deemed that important. And anybody who has been through medical school, you get your cadaver in that first year, and you learn all about the parts and pieces of the body, mind you, on its least viable day on the planet. But it is a way to learn. So everything that you take out and remove from the body has to be scrupulously uh, labeled and tagged so that at the end of that semester, it goes back to the family for cremation, burial, what have you, except the fascia. You can just check that in the bin. It's not that important. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's almost an unconscious bias in the medical world uh, against this uh, tissue is actually being a tissue or being something. So thank you. Now, we at the Fascia Congress define uh, fascia as all collagen-based connective tissues. It surrounds and interpenetrates all of the muscles, all of the bones, all of the organs, and all of the nerves. It's kind of like MasterCard. It's everywhere you want to be. <laughs> and uh, lastly, it forms a three-dimensional structure of uh, support for the human frame. And we'll look at uh, what I mean by all that. So let's go to a typical anatomy picture. Most of you somewhere in your lives have seen pictures that look like this. So just to set up what we're looking at here, what you're looking at is a human thigh. Here's the femur, the leg bone. Here's the quadriceps in the front of the leg. Here's the hamstrings, which we think we all know because they always feel way too tight on us, and they should be. Uh, and that is a very typical, typical uh, illustration. Now, the fascia, the connective tissue, is all this stuff that's a black line that they just kind of forgot to mention. So let's turn that into a real human thigh. Okay. And then let's use the magic of computers to dissolve all the muscle fibers out of that picture. Good. Now let's rotate it. So hit it again. So I want you to appreciate what a interesting, varied network this is going around all the muscles and the bones. We don't have the nerves in here for obvious reasons. Uh, too small to be seen in most cases. And this network builds itself based or, or unbuilds itself based on how you use your body on a regular basis. So where that comes into play clinically is uh, now, you know, I'm from Pittsburgh. My dad worked in mills. You know how that goes. Nowadays, we work in digital mills, OK? Uh, the nice thing about the steel mills was those shops were a lot more physical. But now it's this. So if all I do is do this all day long and then go home and relax on Facebook and my Xbox after about a year, year and a half, this is me. This is what I do. This is how I relate to the world. And my shoulder's killing me, not to mention my neck. And nobody seems to know why. Well, this fascia, which responds to supply and demand, has gradually built up more collagen fibers 
where it needs more collagen fibers to support this thing that I'm doing eight hours a day and then more at night. And where it doesn't need the collagen fiber because it's not being utilized, it will take some of that collagen away. This makes us very malleable. This makes us very adaptable. And it works in both directions. If you can build it up in one direction, you can also build it up in another direction if you know what you're doing. And if the person that you're working with is actively engaged in helping remediate that while they're not on your table. If I'm on your table and I walk back out that door with absolutely no awareness of what you did or why it happened or what it's going to do to me out there, I'm probably not going to get as sustainable results I have if I leave with a little bit of awareness of what I can do when I'm back in the office. So suddenly I leave, but I can move that shoulder. So the next time I'm like, wait a minute, it's creeping forward. Oh, wait, I don't have to do that. So that becomes part of the rehabilitation process is that active self-awareness and then remediation on the part of you. Hit the slide. Okay, uh, hit it again. Sorry, folks, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. So you saw the layers. The layers all have names. The layers aren't really important, and again. And they go all the way inside the muscle, around the individual sheaths, around the individual muscle fibers. Hit it again. And uh, let's go on. Hit it again. And one more time. And so this is, this is just kind of the schematic of that network that I showed you, the rotating thigh. Okay, and this is my friend Diane from Canada, and she says that the muscle, the fascia is the motor units of the muscle, meaning that it's the fascia that gives the pull when the muscle tissues contract to actually move the bones and articulate movement. Okay, and now, what you saw was pretty stayed and solid. Now, if this tissue that I'm talking about is as reactive as it is, uh, it shouldn't look quite so solid and impermeable. That's because, again, we tend to, and even in that rotating thigh, that was uh, done with data from a very, very healthy cadaver, but still a cadaver. So this is a tendon transplant surgeon uh, in Bordeaux. And he had this notion, because when they, when they uh, transplant tendons, they tend to, it's like, it's like laying cable. It's like they clean it off, and they put it in, and they sew it back up, and they go off. And he had the idea of looking at his aquarium one day. Well, you know, we take, if we're moving a fish from one aquarium to the other, we take some of the water with the fish. We don't just take the fish and you know, dump it in the other aquarium. And maybe there's something to helping that living thing integrate into its new environment by taking some of the old environment with it. So he stopped cleaning off his tendons, and he put them in sloppy, and he left some of the fashion connective tissue on the tendons. And what he found was he was cutting his recovery times in half. From these, and it was all, uh, it was all hand, uh, hand, arm, and wrist tendons. Uh, so what he did was he uh, got an endoscopic camera and uh, a really good lawyer and a really good release form, and he got permission to take a camera into the patients while he was surging them, which is the verb form of surgery, uh, to come back with the first pictures of actual fascia connective tissue in its natural living environment. Hit it again, and this is what it looks like. So I want you to see what a lively, liquid medium this is. And when we first saw this at Harvard in 2007, it blew us all away, because we work with this all day long. We feel it under our hands, and we had no idea that it was something, in some cases, as delicate as what you saw just happening there, reacting to the forces being put through it just by that little endoscopic camera. Next one, please. Okay. So. Fascia is fluid and fiber. It's that stuff on your left and the fiber on your, wait, reverse that, uh, left and right. So it's about a 70 to 30 ratio, 70% fluid, 30% fiber. Obviously, if we overuse things, that ratio can get out of whack. Obviously, in something like a tendon, which is also fascially based, that's going to be reversed. You wouldn't want 70% fluid in your tendons, would you? That wouldn't be very too good for your heel bone or your Achilles. You'd want that to be flipped. But the problem is, is that we build up fibrous densities in places that we don't want them, like in my example of the, of the computer jacket. So uh, the word that we use now is the term densification uh, for this, when the, when the fiber uh, outweighs the fluid and suddenly cuts down the mobility. Next slide. Uh, OK. And next slide. That's a fibroblast. And go ahead and hit the button. This is the little critter, the cell that lives in the fascial network. And it's a bit like a nomad, just kind of traveling throughout your connective tissue matrix and remodeling the connective tissue matrix 
based on what you're doing. So you'll see it here as it's pulling threads behind it, reorganizing threads in front of it. This is about a typical 10-hour journey in uh, the day in the life <coughs> of one of your fibroblasts. So a really easy way to understand fibroblasts is when you cut yourself, they kind of get supercharged. Uh, it's like they suddenly get injected with like massive amount of steroidal drugs, get really huge muscles, and they swarm to the cut to start to mend and close that wound so that you don't bleed to death. So that's more of a, of a different kind of physiological uh, property that these have. But their normal day-to-day -day job is to reorganize and keep your fascial net going and go hopefully going smoothly. Okay, uh, this is Robert. He did an experiment that actually was the first experiment to go on record to prove that uh, th this fascia is not an inert packing material. Uh, it's not like the packing peanuts in the box that comes from FedEx, but it's actually uh, a reactive, lively organ. Go ahead and hit it again. And uh, what he did was he suspended a piece of fascia in an organ bath and subjected it to different substances to see if it would contract. Now, we don't need to get into the nuts and bolts of the science of that, but I would like to point something out from the paper, which is the fact that um, nitric oxide, hit it again, go ahead. Um, one of the things that got lost in the paper and everybody went, oh my god, it contract, it must be alive, was that nitric oxide can cause it to relax. Now, I don't want anybody's fascia to contract any more than it has to, but to get it to relax, you betcha. And we did a pilot study at Pitt with Carol Greco, who works in my department, on mindfulness meditation and low back pain. And in the pilot study of 83 people, we found that more than 50% of the people who did mindfulness meditation had up to a 35% reduction in their perception of low back pain. Isn't that interesting? What's the connection? Well, monks. Well, no, not literally monks. But in studies that have been done of monks, of their physiology, uh, it's found that their nitric oxide content is on average 40% higher than in the average humans. So it seems to me to indicate that there is something about meditation that produces nitric oxide. That, causes the that has the potential to cause the fascia to relax, which may explain why just simple meditation can have such a profound effect on the perception of pain within your body. Now, to know that for sure, we need more research. So, if you have some grant money available, talk to me when I'm done. Okay, there's been a lot, of, a huge spike in research uh, involving fascia in the last 10 years, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it's because of these. Um, hit it again. So, this was an article that came out in Scientific American in 2004, and it's about glia. And if any of you have heard of glia, other than you, I will be very impressed. And it's really okay if you have. So basically, the glia are the fascia of the brain. So if you think about that rotating thigh, think about a rotating brain with all the gray matter taken out in just this kind of three-dimensional looking thing that sort of shows you the shape of the brain, but doesn't actually have any of the stuff that we think of as making the brain the brain inside of it. Uh, now, what's interesting about the glia is they were discovered about the same time the neurons were discovered, around the turn of the century, 1900 or so on. And um, the glia actually outnumbered the neurons 9 to 1. But they were very, very tiny. Neurons were big. You can almost see them with, uh, with the staining technique. They weren't quite big enough to see with the naked eye, but with the staining technique still, they were, they were rather big, as opposed to the tiny, tiny, tiny glia. And these scientists were guys. And you know guys, if it's bigger, it must be more important. <laughs> so let's focus on the big stuff here, okay? And the glia were relatively forgotten about. Now, uh, what was discovered in 2003 was that the glia actually do communicate to each other which before was that they, they, they provided structure and some nutritional support for the brain, not that anybody really ever described what that meant. Uh, but they discovered that the glia communicated to each other, but they didn't communicate to each other electrically, which you would expect being in the brain. They communicated to, communicated to each other chemically. So that really shifted a lot of focus into, oh, what's going on there? And we found out that uh, not only did they communicate to each other, so there's the glia right there, those really pretty looking colorful things, specifically ones called astrocytes. And the astrocytes actually can affect how the neurons work. They actually can affect how neurons are formed and make synaptic connections. 
So in the old model of the nervous system, it was like the old time telephones, you know, where you have to have a direct connection wire to wire to wire to make the phone call. The glia operate more like cell phones. You don't have to have a direct connection. As long as you've got the right, as long as you've got the right pickup at the other end, you can pretty much place a call anywhere throughout the body that you want to. Unlike this, the, the telephone uh, model of the nervous system, which is still a valid model, it's just not the whole story. And this is Linda Watkins at the University of Arizona. She's actually doing a lot of really interesting work to talk about how glia relates to pain and perception of pain in the human body. So we're beginning to understand that there is a connection with the fascia of the brain and the fascia of the body and pain issues. Um, and what's really cool, I mean, yesterday was, yesterday was Halloween, but what the heck. Do you know about Einstein's brain? What they did to Einstein's brain? Okay. They saved it. And they kept it in a jar. And I'm not making this up. <laughs> this, the, the coroner very discreetly dumped it in a jar, put it in a cardboard box, and kept it under his desk for years. And word would get out through the grapevine. If you wanted a piece of Einstein's brain to examine, you could just come in and here's your piece of brain. You know, like, you know. Finally, it came out, and um, and uh, it was found out, and, and, and it was returned to the family via a cross-country trip in the trunk of a Cadillac. I'm not making it. Um, but what was interesting about his brain was that they didn't find anything particularly interesting about his brain except that in the, the visual cortex of his brain, and uh, Einstein was a very visual thinker, which is not normal for most people, and in the higher reasoning areas of his brain, his glia to neuron ratio, which in most people is nine glia to one neuron, was 27 to one. And you know me, uh, I'm thinking. Well, if your if your fascia responds to supply and demand physically, why wouldn't it do it the same way in the brain? So is it possible? And let's talk about neuroplasticity. Let's throw in a thing for neuroplasticity here. Why isn't it possible that the more you work on creating new connections or strengthening the connections you already do have in your brain, that that wouldn't cause these glia to multiply and thrive? So there's my plug for neuroplasticity and glia. Next slide, please. Now, the fascia have a lot of mechanoreceptors in them, and I'm not going to get into it in great detail. But mechanoreceptors are basically nerve endings that supply, that, that basically work on mechanical information. They don't work on, they don't work on electrical information. So they, they, they respond to vibration, and they respond to pressure, OK? Like a spring, almost. And uh, there's many different types. I keep them straight by thinking about them as uh, three Italian brothers and their crazy sisters. <laughs> Golgi's, Pacini's, Ruffini's, and Rustichio. It's, it's complicated, and this is just a lot easier. And the Golgi's like it's strong. The Pacini's, they have ADD. They got hair like mine, and uh, they mostly live in the spinal ligaments, which I think has something to do with chiropractic. Oh, wow, thank you a lot. Okay. And the Ruffini's, the Ruffini's are very, very refined. What's cool about Ruffini's, hit the button, uh, and I work with Ruffini's a lot is they respond to slow, they respond to pressure in slow melting glide, okay, which is a typical class that you roll for structural integration stroke. But what's neat about the Ruffini receptors when they're stimulated is they cause a decrease in muscle tension throughout the whole body, not in just a specific place like the Golgi do. Um, so I work with them a lot, uh, and they're really great. Now, the interstitial ones, uh, these are the so-called ones that are responsible for pain. They're the ones, they're, they're called nociceptors, but they're also responsible for pleasure too and a whole lot of other things. And they're literally found everywhere in the body. Uh, and they, they respond differently to pressure different, uh, in, in different ways. We are beginning to map these nociceptors, these type 4 nerve endings. This is from Tassar's lab in uh, Germany, and you can see those little black dots. Uh, which are some of these uh, some of these nerve endings uh, in the white stuff in the low back, the lumbar fascia. If you think about those muscle diagrams, there's always like that diamond of white in, in the base of the back. That's your lumbar fascia, and that could be a whole other lecture just on the lumbar fascia. Next slide, please. So now this, most of these nerve endings live in the sliding layers between the muscles, like you see over there on your left. That looks pretty good and pretty healthy. Now when you have adhesions over there on your right, doesn't look so good, does it? This is places where the fascia is getting stuck to itself and other muscles and nerves and organs, and it's going to change that transmission from these type 4 nerve endings. And basically, the information that they transmit is what's called proprioception. Okay? 
So what the heck is he talking about? So close your eyes. I'm not going to do anything embarrassing to anybody, I promise. Just close your eyes and raise one of your hands, but keep your eyes closed. Okay? Now, without looking, can you all tell that your hand's in the air? Okay. That's proprioception. That is your direct biomechanical, biofeedback circuit giving you the information of where your body is in space, what it's doing. Now, we found uh, in other research that there is a drink, a drink, there's a direct, I think I need water, uh, <laughs> if you would please, uh, uh, there is a direct link or drink to, um, a direct drink. thank you, uh, to proprioception in pain. And in this uh, experiment that Leonin did, uh, he discovered quite simply that if you have a decrease in proprioception, it more likely leads to an increase in pain. So literally, you don't feel that part of your body as as eloquently, as succinctly as you should. And it's not. And sometimes it's below the level, the threshold of awareness. I mean, when your hand was up in the air, you weren't thinking about everything from the tip of your finger to your shoulder that was holding it up. But aggregately, you could feel it. It's the same thing in other parts of the body. If you don't have that general awareness of the body, it's going to create a signal of pain. So if you can induce more awareness into that part of the body, whether it's through what I do, or massage therapy, or yoga, or directed breathing techniques, whatever gets more energy and awareness into that part of the body has the potential to increase proprioception and decrease pain. Fascia also has crimp. Uh, I used to call this warp and weft, but you'll notice how it's got some fibers that go one way and some fibers that go another way. Kind of like pantyhose. Okay, that's what gives its its stretchiness, but it also gives its resiliency. If you pull on pantyhose too tight, it's going to get to a point where it can't go anymore, uh, unless you really, really try really hard and then rip it. But most of us don't do that. Most of us don't do that with our fascia either, and less for sports nuts. So go ahead. And there have been a number of experiments that show, uh, like you see over here on your left, that crimp in a healthy person has that very nice lattice work, but in a relatively sedentary, immobile person, it gets highly disorganized. But it's also been shown, again, this is a two-way street. With the right kind of rehab and therapy, you can restore that two-dimensional lattice in that springiness and have the tension work for you rather than against you. But this is my favorite bit of research. Uh, this is Paul Stanley from the University of Arizona. And he did a very, very eloquent, uh, elegant experiment. Um, where he basically took living cells, subjected them to repetitive motion for nine hours, so doing the same thing the whole time, and then he reversed the conditions of the experiment to do what basically we do in, uh, in, a, in a structural integration way, in a hands-on manual therapy way to make a fascial change, is we had compression with glide and stretch. Now, the stretch usually happens on the part of the person on the table. So if I'm working your hamstrings, you may be taking those hamstrings and moving them, bending in a certain particular way, rotating them to give it the stretch while I have the compression and glide. And he found a very, very simple ratio by accident that 90 seconds of compression and glide with stretch will undo the fibrous buildup from nine hours of repetitive motion. So this is not rocket science anymore. It, it, it's very, very simple. And, uh, and your cells have fascia in them too. They're called the cytoskeleton. And they basically is what gives the cell its shape and its function. Next. Okay. So this is pretty typical of the kind of people that I work with in that I could have all three of these people come see me for low back pain. And those red markers are delineating the position of their hips relative to the position of their rib cage. And as you see, uh, the ribcage and their hips are not really in optimal positions, particularly the guy on the far left, which I call, or the far, your far right, which I call greater than syndrome. You see a lot of that if you just go out there and look. And, uh, but if I treat it, now they may all have low back pain in the same place. I think it's reasonable that we could expect that. But would we treat them the same way, looking at their structure? I hope not. I mean, we could get some good results, but would we really do the best job we could in alleviating the pain and, and making it sustainable for them? I don't think so. So you've got to examine the structure and then change your methodology based on the individual. If we don't, and that was a big topic at the Integrative Medicine Conference this week in Chicago, was we have to individualize treatments, regardless of what modality we're using, uh, uh, because otherwise we're just not going to get the best results. Now, the body is a complicated place. 
So the nice thing about fascia is that it's mappable. Uh, and that was done, oh, I went to the wrong place. So hit another slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I jumped ahead in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so um, would you excuse me for one minute while I do this? This, this, was, this was a talk I gave. Well, anyway, just, uh, let's pause here for one second. And let me redo that. Because uh, the train of thought would make more sense. Uh, yep, there we go. So let's do that. And let's do that. Everybody with me so far? Uh -huh. yeah. Good. Okay. Um, I gave a talk on this at the conference. I asked for, they only gave me a half hour. I had to cut. I had to take things out. And then I got here and it's like, oh, I got to put stuff back in. I got to take these other things out because, you know. So thank you for bearing with me for a minute. So this is a book called Anatomy Trains. And this was, I'm sure you've all heard, everybody in this room has heard and probably said, it's all connected, right? <laughs> OK. Well, it is. Yes, Virginia, it is all connected. <laughs> Just like the roads in America are all connected. But if I don't have a good map, getting from New York to San Francisco is going to take me forever. Okay, It's the same thing with the body. Mm -hmm. So this was the first attempt to actually map out these fascial connections in the body in a way that made anatomical and physiological sense. So go ahead and hit the next button. Uh, so these are some of the maps that I use when I'm treating a patient and taking into consideration. So mostly the way that we uh, study classical anatomy is with something like that. It's one muscle stuck to a skeleton, and if that was the only thing that existed, what would it do? And that's useful to a point, but we need to realize that that muscle is connected to a larger muscle complex. And of course, mind you, I say muscle, but there's fascia and connective tissue around each of those muscles, connecting one to the next to the next to the next. So we have gone into the lab, uh, the anatomist who wrote that book and I, for about five years, actually trying to take these tissues out of the body to prove that this isn't just an interesting mental construct, but that it actually makes anatomical and physiological sense. So what you're seeing here is actually the trapezius. Say, ah, my, my traps are tight. Okay, we've all heard this. We've all felt this. But the trapezius is part of a larger complex that runs down the deltoid muscles and the extensors of the fingers. Okay. But what's interesting, too, and in this particular specimen, was we were actually able to keep the fascial continuity from one trapezius to the trapezius on the other side of the body. So this begins to also point to some areas of why you can be feeling something somewhere, and suddenly I'm working on this shoulder, but that shoulder starts to feel better even though we didn't touch it, because there are also cross connections in the fascial fibers, also going in directions that we have just not even yet begun to really fully map. And there's lots of these maps. We have about uh, 13 of them so far. So when I'm looking at those three guys that you saw with the displacements in their hips and their rib cages, I'm, in my mind, laying these maps on top of them and thinking about what's short and tight and restricted and where do I want to work and what's going to get them the best result uh, right there in front of me today. And then when they come in next week, then we'll worry about establishing you know, more of a regular protocol. But the great thing about these maps are is that I can keep track of where I've been. I can keep track of the results, their results from where I've been, where I haven't gone yet, and where I want to go in the future or maybe need to go back to. So this becomes a very, very good way to just, to just track what we're doing therapeutically. And again, the nice thing about these maps are it doesn't matter what technique you employ. Um, I, one of my favorite classes to teach is uh, to teach these concepts to, to yoga teachers so that they can then leverage that into their classes. It's a lot of fun. And uh, as you can see, they're, they're ev literally everywhere in the body. This is the line that goes down the back of the body that connects the bottom of your foot to actually this part of your scalp. And it's real. Uh, and we'll look at it later. So next slide, please. And uh, here, one more time. There uh, Yes. So is that why when people do the flexology or some stuff, you know, that has, uh, I mean, sometimes people, uh, people will say, well, you know, mm -hmm. I'm doing the work here, but something so very differently available to resolve that pain or problem. You know, it's possible, um, but I think reflexology makes more sense if you look at embryology, uh, because it's also in the ear. And it's also in the hands. And you think about these tissues dividing and splitting this way and taking some information from one to the other. 
Um, and I, you know, I haven't. Um, nobody's done research on the superficial back line and embryology or and reflexology. So the, the the true answer is I don't know. Could there be? Yes, but I think embryology is more likely. Um, now the only reason that I bring this is could you hit the button, please? And I want you to look at what's going on here. So we're tugging on a tendon deep in the calf, but look at what's happening in the foot. Okay. So this no, you don't. We don't need the audio. That's irrelevant. No, I know that. Oh, okay. Turning it down. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't need his. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Sorry. Uh, I shouldn't tell you your job. So, <laughs> but what we're demonstrating here is that you can have an effect because there's such a there's such a parts based mentality. Like we're cards, you just fix the part and everything else fixes itself. But we're showing how a tendon here, way up in the calf, can affect the tissue in a foot. And this is on a dead person. So you can imagine on a live person, the effect could be even more dramatic. Okay. Next slide. So this leads to think of a new way of understanding human structure, which again is this car parts, nuts and bolts kind of idea. And the word here is tensegrity, which is a combination of the word tension and integrity. Because we need a certain amount of tension in our bodies or we just be a pile of bones on the floor moving around like amoebas. So this is when you go to PT school. Uh, mostly what they give you are diagrams that look like this. These levers and pulleys and everything is just you know very, very mechanical. But um, is the elbow joint a lever and a pulley? Of course it is. Does that explain the complexities of the wrist? No, it doesn't. But they still teach it like it does. Now, in the tensegrity model, we build on the triangular design. We don't build on this because a lever and a pulley is a square frame design like this room that we're in, like this house that we're in. Square frame designs, by their very nature, take a lot of support to keep them from falling over, as anybody who owns a house, old house in Pittsburgh knows. Okay? We're not built like that. We're built more like this, because when you apply force to a three-dimensional triangle, it distributes that force evenly throughout the whole structure. So if you want to build the last, it's best to build more on a pyramid model than a square model. Now, if you take these pyramids and you put them together, so we've got one on the left, one on the right, and in the middle, I've actually got two that I stuck together this way. You can put them together and begin to approximate human architecture in a way that makes more sense than levers and pulleys, even though it is more complicated. And people way smarter than I, namely a toy maker and an orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> have begun uh, making these kinds of models like you see here on your left. Well, the idea came from the art world and that sculpture that you see on the right, where you've got these big, heavy steel tubes that are held in place by a tensional network of wire, which is very analogous to our bones, which don't actually ever touch, and our sea of connective tissue and ligaments and tendons. Next slide. Okay? So the easy way to think about tensegrity is when push and pull have a win-win relationship with each other. So you're balanced in your tension, and you're balanced in your structure. So when you approach the body this way from a therapeutic standpoint, you're going to get very different results than you will if you just do it from a typical orthopedic parts based model. And you're going to understand how you can do something in one part of the body and suddenly another part of the body feels better. Because that how because they are connected and it's understanding how they're connected. Next slide. It even works on the cellular level. So we talked about the mind-body connection to the brain. Now let's talk about it in the cell. So this is Donald Ingber from Harvard. And what I want you to notice here is um, <coughs> these little, see these little triangles here and here and here and here and here. Okay. That's showing you the tensegrity connections within the cytoskeleton of this individual cell. The cytoskeleton is made of fascia, very fine fibers, not of fascia, but fascia nonetheless. And what Donald found, next slide, is, oh, go back. <laughs> I ruined the joke. Uh, yeah, so anyway. I we should tell it now. Yeah, no, I have to. Well, I'm um, surprised. <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> I blame jet lag, but it was only Chicago. Um, so what Donald did was he had this theory that cells, as hypothesis, that cells were made more like tents, not like balls. So he developed a way using these tiny magnetic beads and in microscopic machines to manipulate the shapes of cells. And he was successful in doing so. 
And what he found was that if you change the shape of the cell, you change its function. Just like if you change the shape of a human, you change their ability to function in both directions. What he found, actually, contrary to what it looks like in the textbooks with those nice little round balls with the nucleus and everything, is that the rounder the cell got, the more likely it was to die. The more stretched out the cell got, the more likely it was to be healthy and live. <laughs> okay? So I think we can take that as an object lesson from the microscopic world to the macroscopic world. It's, it, it, it's, to me, that's a very, very, very easy leap. And what's interesting, what, <laughs> yeah, yeah, shake your head, please, please. So anyway, um, what's interesting is uh, when, these, when, when you start playing with the shape of the cell, there's a cell receptor. Now, all cells have cell receptors. Most of them respond to chemical information. So you, if you think of the cell as having all these antennas sticking out of it, that are constantly monitoring and listening to the environment for, ooh, some caffeine, ooh, some water, ooh, hey, morphine, you know. And it takes it in and metabolizes it and creates, uh, creates an effect uh, in that cell and then throughout the body. Well, there's a particular receptor that responds to not chemical messages, not electrical messages, but pressure and vibration. And it's called an integrin. Now, when that integrin is stimulated by pressure or vibration, it actually goes all the way down to the nucleus of the cell, right to the DNA, and it causes the DNA to resequence itself. It causes some genes to turn off, other genes to turn on. And there's a fancy name for that, too. But the important thing here is one of the things that we do know is when the integrins are stimulated, they turn off the pro-inflammatory genes and they turn on the anti-inflammatory genes. So that's huge. So that explains why we can have such profound effects physiologically throughout the whole body in our manual therapies, because it's actually having an effect on the cellular level, on the genes and how they express themselves. And we're just beginning to learn how that is, how and how that works, and what else we might be doing. That's one thing we absolutely know for sure. And then there's the stretching. Thing. So here is one of my favorite uh, maps of myofascial connections in the body. And I, I just like to wind up with this uh, because it's fun. So I've talked a lot about theories and ideas here. And then in a moment, I'm going to turn it over to your real world questions. Uh, but I've talked about the idea that, yes, Virginia, it is all connected and we know how. Uh, I've talked about the fact that if it is all connected, if we take tension out of part of the system, we can relax the whole system. Likewise, if we put tension into the system in the right way, we can hypothetically create more stability in the system. Because again, all these things are two-way streets. I mean, that's one of the things that really frustrates me in the orthopedics world is they're very happy to go down the, the road of deterioration but they don't realize that the same mechanisms, I shouldn't say they don't, because some of them do, that the mechanisms of restoration are the same as the mechanisms of deterioration. You just have to reverse the input and take it in the other direction. It's the same highway. So what we're going to do with a volunteer from the studio audience who does not have a shoulder injury um, is what we're going to do is we're going to put tension into the system to show that, yes, the body has tensegrity, and uh, also create more stability in that system in a way that won't embarrass anybody, I promise. So, but let me explain the anatomy here. This is the deep underlying part of most of the musculoskeletal problems that I deal with. So these muscles here actually are in here. So they're behind the calf muscles. They're behind, in front of the calf muscles, but they're behind your shin bone. And that goes into the muscles of the thighs, deep into the pelvis and up along the front of the spine, those of you who may have heard of the psoas. And this is your diaphragm. Okay? The diaphragm is like a big umbrella that sits underneath the ribcage and is actually attached all the way down to your feet. And that fascial connection continues right on up the fascial back around the heart, the pericardium, the lungs, up the esophagus, and all the way to the tongue. Now, those of you who are manual therapists, I think you're the only one in the room, right? Okay. I'm not recommending that if you have a client with fallen arches that you yank on their tongue. <laughs> okay. It might work, but they probably won't have that. But, however, now, and uh, I, I, I'm not so much that I can, uh, that, that I can uh, demonstrate the way to uh, help restore integrity to an arch that has collapsed, which is an awful word I hate to use, but it's a good one. Uh, what I would like to do is, is leverage this idea of tensegrity and the fact that the feet are connected to the tongue. 
uh, to create more stability. So I need my volunteer. Just somebody who doesn't have a shoulder rotator cuff in. I have a rotator cuff. Oh. Okay, great. And we don't know each other. <laughs> okay, so very, very, very simply. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get him to try to use some muscular tension to stabilize himself. And then I'm just gently going to try to, no, you stay right there. I'm just gently going to try to pull on him to try to, you know, knock him off his feet a little bit, but not in the way that he'd actually fall. You need Sandy? Pardon me? You need Sandy to knock him off. <laughs> <laughs> is this something personal? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's first? Here, David. So what I want you to do is I want you to flex at the elbow here, and I want you to really, really, really really contract all the muscles in your arm and shoulder, but hold it steady, okay? And I'm just going to try to pull you off your feet, okay? Okay. Wasn't so hard. Wasn't so hard. Thanks. Okay. Now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're on. You're on. Do it again. Oh. Not bad, but I could do it. Okay. But that was nice. Broaden your stance. A good strategy. I'm going to give you a better strategy. So this time I want you to lock in, and I want you to take your tongue. But pardon me? Same. Which same, same, same. Same. Okay. So you're going to do everything you just did, but this time I want you to take your tongue and I want you to jam it up into the roof of your mouth as hard as you possibly can. Okay? You ready? Can't do it. Can't do it. Because we activated tension in this deep front line or the core line of the human body and increased its stability. I've been talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen him walk on his tongue? <laughs> so anyway, that that's 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 my thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. That that's my little that's my little bar trick. Uh, so. It's great when you're running low on money at a convention. Can I add so. that that's that's a Tai Chi and a Qigong technique to put, and a, like a pranic healing technique as well, like to put the the tongue on the top of the. Mouth. That's a very good thing to so add. Stability. Right. Probably not with the amount of force that Peter just did though. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a very, very, very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. So, next slide. Um, and next slide. And next slide. So, I do have a blog, um, fashionalconnections.com. And more than just being about fashion connective tissue, uh, it also is looking at all kinds of aspects of mind body medicine. Uh, I posted a lot of things uh, from the conference most recently that I was at from there. And it's meant for the general reader. It's not meant for the medical population. And it's all kind of done in nice bite-sized morsels. And if you want to dive in deeper and follow the links and, and get more detailed information, that's there too. But it's, it's a nice handy website that you can kind of just go to and learn more information about you and your body and you. Uh, and it's, it's you know, mind-body medicine yoga, meditation, fascia, all these things are included in the blog uh, as I find new and interesting information that I think is frankly worth sharing. And the best part is no comments. I don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. Nobody has time for that. So I, I, if people want to contact me, you can email me and say, hey, I think this about this. And if it's relevant, I'll put it in. But I don't run, maintain, have no interest in having a comment section. So anyway. Uh, at this point, that's my little introduction to a part of your body that you mostly probably didn't even know that you had. Uh, so now I'd like to actually open up the floor for questions. You teach yoga? Um, I took yoga teacher training, but I did that for my own self-knowledge. I don't teach okay. yoga. I, I would, um, you know, I understand the stretching and gliding, and tell me more about the pressure. Okay. Like, uh, like I'm a yoga teacher, okay. so I'm, I'm interested in, you know, the pressure mm -hmm. as well as, but you know what I just noticed? Mm -hmm. I was sitting here and all I did was put my tip of my tongue in my roof of my mouth, and I can feel a little pelvic floor, yep. a little mm -hmm. pulling in, mm -hmm. very yeah. slight. Because you've got really good proprioception and interoception, mm -hmm. probably because of the yoga so that's that's great. So um, when you say you want to say more about the pressure, can you give me a little more context? Well, I'm thinking of like yoga poses. You know, you're you're stretching. Your where's the pressure coming in? As far as what I could do <coughs> with my classes, mm -hmm. I'm probably doing it, but I'm not recognizing it as pressure. Uh, that's likely. I mean, yoga, you know I mean, yoga is definitely adding 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 the the stretch and potentially the glide. Um, 
for me, where I was going with the other thing was more about learning to divine different individual shapes. So what I find quite often is that postures that you really love going into probably are more are postures that are predisposed to your physical pattern, and that's why they feel good, because you're stretching okay. into the point of ease, whereas the ones that kind of suck may be the ones that you need to be doing more of mm -hmm. because of something about your shape. And, and if you know if you know the right reason for doing it, you're a more likely to do it, and b more likely to do it correctly rather than oh I got to do this oh god what did I just do you know which I think we've all done one time or right. another, uh, and then you think well maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. Uh, and of course yoga isn't about force, although we're Americans, so uh, we just naturally bring that to everything. We do. Mm -hmm. um, so um, did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, because yes. the, the compression for me more comes from a manual therapy perspective. Well, that's what I would, yeah, you know, that's what my you know, from the yoga, and, and one of my dearest friends is the best yoga therapist I've ever met, um, you know, and she will use sandbags, and she will use props, and she will use straps, and do all kinds of other things to create the same kind of changes that I create with my hands. So I see the props is what's that right. compression, but in a, in a normal yoga class, uh, I don't, you know, I don't really know. Now, obviously, the compression, let's say you're doing uh, more of your three, uh, obviously, you're going to be doing something to build up more mm -hmm. integrity in the standing leg, mm -hmm. uh, or even in more your two, in both legs, but differently. Mm -hmm. So I can see that is being a possible compression element in those kinds of cases. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So, how did you get into <coughs> Is that I'm established into what uh, structural yeah. integration? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I started out 22 years ago as a, a clinically minded massage therapist. So um, I didn't want to make wait, that's going to sound wrong. I didn't want to make people feel good. Um, <laughs> I wanted to do more than just make people feel good. I wanted them to feel better, and I wanted them to feel better longer. Um, so I just always have that, that clinical bent. So if we go back to the slide with three dudes with low back pain, um, I got to a point after about eight years, and I, I had some very good teachers, I learned a lot of good things. Um, but I couldn't understand why you've got the same symptomatic pain as her and her. You got better in seven visits. It took you 21, not too shabby, but I only see you maybe once every couple of months now. You never got better at all. <laughs> why didn't you get better? What's wrong with me? Anyway, uh, <laughs> so um, and then I, I started. You know, music's you all about me. Um, How did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Energy and intention, baby. Uh, so anyway, I uh, and I started after you know eight years or so, uh, of, and I, I considered myself that pretty good body mechanics. Uh, I started developing some of my own repetitive usage issues. Um, so I went to a woman named Christine Troples, who practiced out of the open mind in Swickley at the time, uh, who did something called Heller work, which you might remember I said was the whopper. Uh, and in that first session with her, and i kind of always been curious about this, but I didn't really know what it was. Um, but in that first session, I hit the trifecta. I went, oh my god, this is exactly what my body needs. Oh my god, this is what I think I've been trying to figure out how to do without having a clue, and oh my god, I need to go learn this as fast as I possibly can. I mean, it just it, the work spoke to me that profoundly that I knew this was the direction I needed to go into. So I was fortunate enough to find a, a good school uh, with a really, really strong anatomical and physiological foundation, as opposed to, well, that's what I did, which some of the schools are, well, that's what I did, so that's what we do. Uh, the school had more of a foundation on the uh, anatomy trains model. Uh, and I just, you know, sold the pearl of great price and bought my tickets and, and, and went and never went back. And, and, and what's nice is I find from a therapeutic context, and, you know, uh, I've been in business for myself for 22 years now, and, you know, it's good to have customers, it's good to have repeat customers. Um, but I, it's a good business model. I don't know that it's a good therapy model. Uh, some of you who have undergone psychoanalysis for way too long, you spend years and years and all this money finding out all the reasons why you can't change. Uh, I didn't want to be that kind of therapist. Uh, so now I can actually present them with a beginning, a middle, and an end to their therapy, and then I release them with their own cognizance, and they come in when they need a tune-up. Sometimes I don't see people for a year or two. Uh, 
Sometimes they come in every six weeks because they maybe have very physically demanding jobs. Or I've got a, a couple of like unbelievably high performance athletes who insist on coming in every week. And you know what? I haven't gotten bored with them yet, so I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. It's not like, okay, we're doing the same thing and I'm just sleeping through it. No, because of the demands they put on their bodies, uh, a weekly tune-up for somebody of that caliber, very, very well warranted. But for most of us, it's a, it's a 10 to 12 visit uh, protocol over a period of three to five months. Actual mileage varies depending on pre-existing conditions like <laughs> surgeries uh, and, and other biomechanical issues. Uh, and I've also gone on since then to study uh, doing neural work uh, and visceral work at the Brawl Institute, which is learning how to change uh, and free restrictions in the fascia around the nerves and in the fascia and the ligaments around the organs. So in cases of, um, I'll give you a real good real world case, uh, there's a patient I'm currently treating, there's a lot about her that I can't help, but one of the side effects of what she's been through is unbelievable reflux, nausea, and vomiting. Well, it's to the point now where she doesn't have it. Now, there's other things with her that I wish I could change, but I can't, but just that alone, in terms of her quality of life, is huge. So um, all these things come together now. I'm having, um, I do a lot of energy work. Do you do any energy? Well, if you want to debate it, it's all energy work. Yeah. <laughs> so. But a lot of pain is going away with people through energy work, and it's, um, it does affect the connective tissue because it's all made of water, and I think water is like the main, I don't know how to explain it, but. <laughs> keep going, keep going. I'm with you, I'm with you, keep going. Because like, the connective tissue has so much water in it, and we're all made of water, and you can't destroy a water model molecule. Mm -hmm. so it's like the vibrations and the... Um, Yeah. What I want to recommend, no, okay. What I want to recommend to you, Gerald Pollack, P O W A L A C K, The Secret Life of Water. Uh, you can find him on YouTube. Uh, he just wrote a wonderful book, which is like hardcore science meets Dr. Seuss. It's great. I mean, in terms of illustrations, I mean, it's a fun book to read. You know, and and, and Jerry, oh, he's a character. I used to from the University of Washington. He's like, point so I was like, we really don't know a whole heck of a lot about water. I mean, why is it that if you put hot water in an ice cube tray, it will actually freeze faster than cold water? Mm -hmm. And, okay, so if water vapor comes up off the lake or the ocean and forms clouds, why does it deform these screws? Why isn't it just, why does it aggregate and form, you know? So the more you actually get into some of the things about water, the less we know about it. And he, his work is all about the fourth state of water, which he calls bound water, uh, which is neither solid, liquid, nor gaseous, but somewhere in between. And he's done these crazy things, like take two beakers of water, pass a charge through, and create a, bridge, a tangible bridge from one beaker to the other of water, as long as the charge is passing through it. That uh, doesn't drip, doesn't leak. Um, and moreover, uh, this fourth stage water is... Uh, has a potential charge to it, or has a potential storage capacity to it, like a battery. Uh, what activates the charge in this water? Sunlight. It's that simple. And about 50% of the water in your connective tissue and fascia is this fourth state water. And we've known about this fourth state water since the 1900s, and there's been hundreds of papers published on it, but just not a lot of people knows about it knows about it. And he's really doing his missionary effort to popularize these ideas and also figure out, well, this is cool, but what does it really mean? What can we do with this information? Because it, it, it's just information. If we can't actually bring it back to the person in front of us or, or help it improve our lives, it doesn't really do a lot of good. But Jerry's, Jerry's just doing amazing, amazing work. And by the time I finish his book again and watch the video a few more times, I might be able to speak about it more intelligently. <laughs> but, but you watch it, you're going, yeah, wow, yeah. And then it's like, Oh, how do I explain that? <laughs> watch again. You know, uh, and it's not because I mean he's a very entertaining speaker. Uh, so it's it's not him. It's just that his concepts are so out there. It just it's going to take a while to really, uh, really for me anyway, make them more comprehensible. So, but worth checking out. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you do a great job of describing all the science. Yeah. And uh, all these things. Mm -hmm. We have a room full of mental health professionals. 
So I know from my personal experience. That's why that joke didn't work. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I know from my personal experience that um, I did the rolfing side of things with, you know, our buddy Brian. But after a ten series of rolfing, I was so happy. Like my mental state of happiness was light years beyond what I was used to for about six months or so. Mm -hmm. Really peaked. Can you, is there any way to explain that connection between happiness and good tensegrity? Did anyone say mm -hmm. that? Happiness and good tensegrity. Yeah. Oh, like is there a connection? Do you know a connection? Or do you have any anecdotal stories about oh, yeah. mental health mm -hmm. situations that get improved by manipulating the fascia? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've also seen it, I've worked with some borderline cases, and they're frightening, and I can't really say no to them, but at least I have a medical supervisor behind me. Uh, so I, you can also go the other way if you're yeah, at the yeah. extreme end of things. Uh, so I do need to put that caveat out there. Um, that's an area that is particularly intriguing to me. Um, I do think there's, I do think there's some kind of connection between what's going on with the fascia in the brain and the fascia in the rest of the body and the nervous system. Okay, that 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 it just it just presupposes that there's something in that connectivity uh, that would explain these physiological effects. But but you know the, the simplest thing I can describe is how many people how many of you work with depression? Okay, what do you notice about depressed people? They slump over, yeah. and then yeah. and they've probably been doing this a long time. You know, you know. Hi, you know I'm so sad. You know you don't see it. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Which car? And we have drugs. We have drugs for these people. We don't have drugs for these people. They they go into politics. Um, so. Which causes which? That's the. Which is the <laughs> but see, but see, but see, that's the thing. I think we're always looking. You know, and and you know. If then statements are powerful, but they don't always get the job done. Uh, so you know, if we can't change your mind about your body, maybe we can change your body about your mind. So I have, and and I love when I get a referral from a psychologist with somebody who has a problem like alcoholism, uh, physical or sexual abuse, uh, or even just depression, because it's like breathe. <laughs> okay, so if I can get them breathing better, that's going to be the first place I go on somebody like that, is get that chest open, get the breathing. We may spend the whole hour of that first visit just getting them to breathe better. It's okay, the next time you're in a red light, turn off whatever it is and just, okay, I just opened it from the outside in. Now that you can find it, you can continue that process from the inside out. So just getting somebody to breathe better is going to help every cell in their body and potentially create a better environment for other physiological changes. And what I have found from the psychologists that I've been referred to is they feel like, okay, maybe if they can make a breakthrough on their physical selves, maybe we can get over the whatever it is that's in their way of their mental selves. Mm -hmm. Because we're stuck and we're not getting anywhere, but I also don't want to keep this person out of my practice either, because sometimes keeping them status quo is better than saying, go away, because then you're going to do this, and you know, that's valid too. Um, but I don't, uh, and that's that's what Joseph Heller, Heller work, his whole thing was what is going on. And it's funny, a lot of people, a lot of the old timers in my field, like in their 80s, they're all like PhD psychologists, it's weird. Uh, so in the 60s and 70s, a lot of them were attracted to this. But I don't know of anybody who has really come up with a good design to study those kinds of effects. But I see them all the time. Uh, but if you take that basic depressed posture uh, and work to change it, you know, is, is that going to change their mind about their depression? No, but it's giving them the physiological structure to support other potential changes. And I think that's important, too. Yeah, there have actually been studies done of when, you know, people have a certain posture and then they change their posture and they have depression, that their depression mm -hmm. is alleviated purely on posture. Mm -hmm. Like, you can find studies out there. Yeah. And if you, um, you know, just look in the mirror and you smile like you're really depressed and you force yourself to smile for 10 minutes, you'll feel happier. So it's like the bottom up mm -hmm. um, way of dealing with it. How it works scientifically, you know, we're not exactly sure, but um, we know that it does. Well, isn't it sort of like you can behave yourself into thinking a certain way, 
or you can think yourself into behaving. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's it's kind of the same idea. Yeah. Well, it's also the biological basis of fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and I mean that in the best possible. Yeah, it's not just metaphor. Mm -hmm. No, it isn't. It is. It is. Now, it might not mean that going through that divorce is going to suck any less, right. but it might give you an easier time of being easy with yourself about going through it. So I think all these things have a certain. They have certain endpoints to their utility in the overall. It fixed everything, you know, yeah. uh, which is a nice idea. Uh, but that's very good. Thank you for sharing the both of us. What did you say again? Because that was brilliant. You can behave yourself into thinking a certain way, like like yes, you said. Yes, or you can think you know, yourself into behaving or a certain thinking, way. Right, like you know, I'm you ever so work with with, with somebody <laughs> like kids that have been bullied, and they might walk around like you know, and I say, you know what? Mm -hmm. Just stand taller and look yeah. stronger and look people in the eye and mm -hmm. and you're perceived a different way and if you start yes. noticing that and how much of their being bullying was because they were already had a yes. tendency to be that way in the first place hey there's yeah. a target boom you know I mean yeah. there you go bullies don't tend to pick up people yeah. I used to go downtown with my cousin he would always get mugged and I never did yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know I just laughed. Mm -hmm. God, you're a tough audience. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Glad you're really, joining. Truly informative and completely wonderful. Mm -hmm. Referrals possible. Referrals for our patients. <coughs> um, do they just contact through this? Do you take insurances? Do you not? Okay. Um, yes. Give them that. That's my cell number on that and, and my email address. Mm -hmm. uh, if any of you want more brochures, give me your address and I'll send them to you. Um, as of now, I do not take insurance. Uh, I do work on a sliding scale where it's necessary, particularly in the last four years, it's been very necessary for a lot of people. But also, um, like getting your car repaired, after that first visit, you're probably going to get an estimate, so you're going to have an idea. Uh, so, so I find that most, you know, for some people, even that is impossible, and that's where the sliding scale comes in. But mm -hmm. sometimes with MasterCard and Visa, it's navigable. The nice thing about this work is that, generally speaking, when you walk out of that door after the first visit, and my first visit isn't based on whatever the Rolf first session is or the KMI first session is. It's based on what's going to give you the most tangible result now that you can start working with when you walk out that door. Most people feel something has really changed. And then they go out and live for a week, and then they really get and say, okay, here's how this change is affecting my daily life, and they come in the next week, and they're really ready to, to get down to work in a different way. There are some people who are slow translators. I don't know why. They literally have to go home and sleep on it, wake up the next day, and, oh, wow, yeah. And then there's that small percentage for whom it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, is I don't waste a lot of people's time or money. Oh, it didn't work? Well, we need you to come in three times this week. You know, right. I don't believe in that. Right. So the first appointment is roughly about an hour? I like 90 minutes when it's okay. possible because that gives me the time to do a thorough uh, medical history, body interview, uh, structural analysis, and so on and so forth, and give them a full treatment. But I can still do, you know, in a 50 or 60 minute session, I can be more thorough on that, less thorough on the treatment end of things, but still give them a tangible result. Now, is that first appointment based on what you're going to do throughout that appointment as far as cost goes, just so we can kind of give mm -hmm. our patients a heads up, or is it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, basically um, what I did was uh, I, I liked having the 90 minutes, uh, and I had a real problem charging extra for it, and after a couple of years, I said, that's not fair to me. Um, and uh, so what I did was I gave people the option. You can do a 60-minute one for this price. Right. You can do a 90-minute one for that so price. It's okay. up to you. And more people take the second option, which really surprised me. Right. But I thought, let's experiment with it and see. Uh, but for people for whom $150 for a first visit is a barrier, they're still able to come in uh, at the $100 for the 60-minute for the visit, and, and it's okay. Thank you, because those are just questions. You're patients are right, sure. And, and, and I'll, let, me, let me add this then, too, because I'm very, very firm on this. Um, you know, and, and if it's a patient you know is going to need to come in on a sliding scale, mm -hmm. uh, if they ask you how much that is, it's about what fits their budget. I am not going to, I'm never going to name an amount. It's like you, you, you know, come in for that first visit, 
figure out if this works for you, and then figure out what works under your budget, and you tell me. Okay. okay. Uh, and so that that's, I want you to know that. Thank you. You're welcome. So we can add that to our resources. Absolutely. And maybe even this brochure can be, we have a resource segment into our website. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can add the brochure to you. I can send it to you. That's easy. So. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.